welcome to the University of Santa Monica, the worldwide center for the study and practice of spiritual psychology. My name is Veronica Albice, and I'm the director of admissions for the university. And I've had the pleasure of speaking with many of you who are already here this evening. And for some, this is your first introduction to the university, so I'm extending a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. It's my honor to introduce you to the founding faculty and designers of our graduate programs. Drs. Ron and Mary Holnick are both licensed marriage and family therapists. Dr. Mary Holnick is also a clinical psychologist. Prior to their over 30 years of service here at the University of Santa Monica, they were instructing master's and doctoral level students at New Mexico State University. They've co-authored the book, Loyalty to Your Soul, the Heart of Spiritual Psychology. If you were to look up the word to teach in the dictionary, you would see that it says to impart information or impart knowledge. If you look up the word educate, it comes from the root word educare, which means to draw out from within. The doctors Holnick are not teachers. They are educators in every sense of the word. Please join me in welcoming Drs. Ron and Mary Holnick. Well, thank you all for coming here this evening. This is really a, uh, an historical evening, as you can tell from the cameras that are in the room. This is the first time that we're ever filming one of these information evenings. So I trust that we will be able to say what we'd like to say and not be too frightened. <laughs> 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 so. Education the way you always wished it would be. We like to start there all the time. So we begin by involving you in the educational process here at USM. We're going to actually ask you to answer this question. And no current students or graduates. So if you were going to go and participate in a program that was going to be education the way you always wished it would be, what would be going on there? How would that be different from education the way you always didn't like it to be? Let's put it that way. Sir? My name is Ricardo. And the thought that came to my mind when you posed the question was that I would like to, res I think of knowledge as truth. And what I would like to come away with from this process is, uh, is to be anchored more in knowledge, but more significantly anchored in truth that, that I could then base my life experience against going forward. And, and could another word for that, uh, that word truth be knowing, to have a sense of inner knowing? Absolutely, because I think there is something there's a knower that resides within me yes. that knows. I'm and not sure that I'm connected with it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to be. And would you be willing to consider the possibility that the way to convert knowledge into knowing would be through experience? As long as I'm not regurgitating my past experiences. <laughs> well, okay, that's, that's, that's a part fair. of my problem. That's fair. <laughs> that's fair. Well, and and I really understand what you're what you're saying there, because uh, digging around in your history, and kind of involving yourself in a form of what we might call archaeology, may not really lead to uh, knowing nor to wisdom, but yet there can be an experience of issue resolution and healing that does lead to the awakening of the deeper truth of who you are. As you were speaking that, I, one of the things I know about myself is that I've learned to function over those core issues. 
From in spite of? Is that what you mean, in spite of? In spite of. Yes, yes. And I, I think you probably speak for every person in this room. <laughs> you know, we've learned to function in, in spite of them. Right. And wouldn't it be wonderful to participate in an educational process that was designed to assist you in resolving them? That's perfect. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. By the way, you notice that we clap at USM whenever anyone shares. And the reason we do that, it's not that we necessarily agree with what they said, but we applaud them for having the courage to simply stand up and say what's true for them in that moment. And this goes on all the time at USM, every time anybody shares. So, somebody else like to share? My name is Philip. Um, one thing that I would like it to be is to have a lot of unconditional love and support behind it. I think that's really important. It, uh, would, that would help me create, you know, spark my creativity and my excitement about the program. So a lot of unconditional love and support that would spark your, your creativity. You know, it's really amazing that you're saying that because from my point of view, the educational environment is so, so important. An educational environment that's not only unconditionally loving and supportive, but also designed to evoke that creative spirit within. My, my undergrad degree would tended to be I felt stagnant quite often. I was just going to class, sitting through lectures, listening, taking a test. This is not that. <laughs> I understand well, that. Well, so it sounds like you're also saying that you'd like an educational process that's dynamic and yeah, enlivening. And participative, you know. Yes. Like. And how about, how about relevant and meaningful? Well, that, that would be an extra, sure. All right. <laughs> how about sacred? Sacred. That's, I hadn't thought of that one. That's great. And how about, while we're doing all of that, we're having fun. Excellent. Where do I sign? <laughs> In the back. All right, thank, thank you very you much. Sharing. All right, so let's start in. Veronica shared that USM's mission is communicating the principles and practices of spiritual psychology worldwide through the process of soul-centered education. Now when you read that statement, those are very nice sounding words. And if I were sitting where you are, there would be two sets of words that I'd probably want to know a little bit more about. And that is spiritual psychology and soul-centered education. So let's start with soul-centered education. What do they mean by soul-centered education? So soul-centered education recognizes that there is such a thing as spiritual reality. And it begins with a principle that a better description of us really, rather than human beings who have a soul, is that we are souls having a human experience. That you're a soul having a human experience. And if you think about it, that is a radical paradigm shift for most people to make that kind of a leap in consciousness. I mean, how would your life be different if you approached it knowing that you were a soul having a human experience? If your life was going to be soul-centered, how might that be different for you? And if you start asking a question like that, one place to begin is in the domain of psychology. And that takes us to those second words. Why do we call it spiritual psychology? What is that all about anyway? That's going to be our task tonight, is to really see if we can, you know, in this short amount of time we have, give you the essence of what we work on essentially for two years here. So. If you were to look up the word psyche in the dictionary, which we did, what you would find is something like breath, principle of life, soul. 
And so you'd probably figure, well, okay, that sounds about right, psyche, breath, principle of soul. So you'd think that psychology would be the study of that. So if you look up the word psychology in the dictionary, what you find is the science of mind and behavior. What happened? <laughs> psyche got hijacked. <laughs> so you could think of the task of spiritual psychology is to bring the field of psychology back to its roots, back to what it was supposed to be about from the beginning. So in a way, you could say that those words, spiritual psychology, are redundant. But nevertheless, we use it that way so that we make it very clear to people what it is that we are doing here. And so our definition of spiritual psychology is a technology that empowers students to convert their everyday life experiences into rungs on the ladder of their spiritual evolution. Uh-oh, two more words. Spiritual evolution. Now what are they talking about when they use those words? What does that mean anyway? Well, first and foremost, I think that when you start talking about spiritual evolution, the question that must be addressed is, who am I? Who, who is it living in this body? Who is it that Ricardo wants to bring forward and get to know more, that he suspects is in there, but he's not really quite quite sure. Who is living in there? And a secondary question that comes from that is, why are you here? What are you doing here in this, in this funny looking body that gets old, walking around doing stuff? What are we doing here? And people who ask that question generally ask a third question, which is, and how can I make a more meaningful contribution in my world. So three questions that people who are concerned with spiritual evolution are talking about. So let's go to our new technology here and take a look at this. So most people are living in what we would call a materialistic reality. You're going to love this. <laughs> Physical world reality. There's a negative side, there's a positive side, and we tend to want to move into the direction from the negative to the positive. And we've pretty much all grown up with the idea that that will make us happy, that will bring fulfillment and that's the goal of life. And so we refer to it as the goal line of life. And this is the way the vast majority of people live their lives on this planet in that reality. In addition to this reality, there is a whole other reality operating that we refer to as spiritual reality. Spiritual reality has nothing to do with success in the physical world. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's independent. And spiritual reality requires a whole different kind of learning than does success in, in physical world reality. All kinds of workshops and books and things out there about how to have a successful life, how to live the life of your dreams, how to fulfill all your desires, uh, all of that. But if you think about it, it's all based on success in physical world reality. Spiritual reality requires a different kind of learning, which is why here at USM, we refer to it as the learning line of life. So we have our own uh, language that we develop here, and that's you know, part of why uh, immersing oneself in the program is really learning a new language. So goal line living, learning line living. And you might ask yourself, well, okay, I see that line ascends upward. Where does it go to? You know, what happens when you get up there? All the world's major religions 
agree on this. It goes to one place and one place only. And that is, it goes to love. That if you wanted to take another word and substitute it for God or spirit, all the world's religions would put love in there. So love is where we're going. Now, here's a very important point. If you learn nothing else from your time here this evening, hear this loud and clear. It's not that you become more loving. You may behave in ways that one would say, uh, that's a more kind, considerate way to behave. But you can't become more of what is your basic inherent nature. If your nature is love, you can't become more loving. If your nature is to breathe, you can't breathe more. Understand that? Well, then what is it that we become when we evolve spiritually? What we become is more aware of that place inside within where that loving being resides. That's the place that you were talking about experientially knowing. So what happens, because most people in this world don't have this kind of a technology, and so they're doing life as best they can, they're evolving just through their experience, but it can be a slow process, because here's what happens. We start to move possibly toward the negative or toward the positive, it doesn't matter. And what happens is, we go a certain distance away from our evolution, and we start to get feedback. If you move in the negative direction, it looks like suffering. Suffering can be found on the positive direction. There are a lot of people suffering from too much abundance. Think about that and what it involves. And so they get feedback, and if they're smart, they turn back, and then maybe they go this way, and they get feedback, and they go back again. And don't we all know some people, nobody in this room, of course, who is doing this? You know, then this. And there are some people who are doing this. <laughs> I think you get the idea. So would it be of any value to you if you could learn a technology where what would happen is, as you started to go off course, you immediately caught on what you were doing, and you course corrected and came back, and then your life spent a lot less time going out to those extremes before you got the feedback that would enable you to grow spiritually. Would that be of any value to you? That's what we do here. This is what is our specialty, and that is what we do here. You could think of the goal line as satisfying physical appetites. Goal line. The learning line is for fulfilling spiritual hunger. for answering the call of spiritual yearning. It's in everybody. Just some people are more aware of it than others. I'm sorry to tell you this, but no matter how much you create in physical world reality, you will never find happiness in it. Because happiness is not to be found in physical world reality. It's not designed that way. Why not? Because the more you create, there's always more. It's set up that way. You will find happiness and fulfillment on the learning line. The greatest challenge that you will face is learning to reorient yourself to living within the context of spiritual reality, soul-centered education. So when you answer the question, who am I, that question can only be answered on the learning line. It can't possibly be answered on the goal line of life. If you ask the question, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? Well, that answer can be found on both the goal line and on the learning line. Everybody's purpose is to go home. To return home. Spiritual teachers have been telling us that for centuries. To go home to what our home really is. 
if you fulfill your purpose on the goal line, and some people have more of a sense of that than other people. There are some people who came in knowing they wanted to be doctors, or they wanted to be musicians, or they wanted to be poets, and they fulfill that desire. And that's very much on the physical world reality on the goal line. So that one you can do on both lines. How about making a meaningful contribution in the world? You'd think that would be all goal line, wouldn't you? Obviously, if I'm a musician and I'm playing and performing, that's all goal line. But here's something that you may never have thought about before. That when you are making a meaningful contribution in the world, the higher that you go, spiritually speaking, the more you evolve into that awareness of loving, every time you resolve one issue, one hurt, one upset, the whole of humanity moves forward because you have successfully transformed part of the negativity that exists in this world into the light or into love or into spirit. The higher you go, you literally become, um, this may sound like funny terminology, but you become a walking prayer. Everywhere you put your feet becomes sacred ground because that's what you vibrate, that's what you radiate. So that's the kind of stuff that we're talking here. So you may ask the question, well, all right, you got my attention. How do we do this? How do, how do I evolve spiritually? What's the process? What does it look like? And to start that conversation, we love to refer to one of our very, very, very uh, favorite mystic poets by the name of Jalaluddin Rumi. And Rumi said, your task is not to seek for love, but merely, merely, <laughs> as if it were easy, but <laughs> merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. And to that we would add, and to resolve them, or and to dissolve them, or and to let go of them. You get the idea. So that's the kind of thing that we have been talking about here. Well, what are these barriers and how does this work? So let's take a, a little trip here into consciousness and see uh, how we map this out so you get a sense of what the dynamic is. It's important. If you're going to spend time and effort considering spending two years here, uh, you want to really, really think about this. Because I'll tell you, this is not work for the faint of heart. This is not going to school and taking notes and parroting it back for the quiz. This is anything but that. This is highly experiential where we really go inside and dissolve those barriers. So I'm going to give you a sense of what, of what that's about. Another way to speak about the goal line of life is to set it up this way. There's the physical world. It's how I relate to the world that I live in. Here I am, I'm, uh, I'm inside this body, and there's all this physicality going on. How do I relate to it? When I start to go inside, the very first thing I become aware of is this thing called the mind, the mental realm. That's all of my thoughts, my beliefs, my attitudes, the way I think things should be, uh, the very definitions I hold about what reality is and how it functions and all of the things I was brought up with and all of the things that my parents and my tribe drilled into me and all my early training in various different formats. It's, it's all in there. Very, very, very important, the mental realm. We spend a fair amount of time with that. If we go deeper inside, we come up to this other level, or we come down into this other level, the emotions, how I feel about what's going on in physical world reality. And if you were looking for a good definition, some people like definitions, of what an ego is, 
and I think probably in psychology they would agree with this, that it's a combination of the mind and then the energy that exists in the emotions. You could think of it as the mind thinks of things and the emotions are there to give you the energy to do it out into the world. There's another level beneath this that we get into sometimes just a little bit called the unconscious. And we find that as we do this work in the mental and the emotional, there are things in the unconscious that bubble up for us to work with as well. But we don't focus on those. Believe me, we've got enough to do in the ego levels. If stuff bubbles up, great. Now one of the things that these levels all have in common is that they have duality. There is a positive and a negative. Whenever you're existing in ego reality, there's a positive and a negative. There's a plus side to things, there's a negative side. If I have a belief that this is the way it should be, then this is the way it shouldn't be. You get that idea. This polarity is built into it. And these levels align with each other. So if you believe that you have a great job, you will feel good going to work in the morning. If you believe that you have a crummy job, you won't feel so good going to work in the morning. So there's this alignment. So most psychological systems work pretty much within this kind of a format, and they stop right there. Spiritual psychology takes it to another level because we're aware that deeper yet still is what we call the authentic self. The authentic self. Notice immediately, characteristic of the authentic self, there is no duality. There is no duality at the authentic self. What goes on there? Well, that's the place of unconditional love that was referred to earlier. That's all that goes on there. Plus its derivatives, peace, acceptance, and compassion. This is what you'll find when you access the authentic self inside of yourself. This is the level that people who meditate a lot and people who go on spiritual retreats and things of that nature are attempting to access. We're presenting you with a whole other p potentiality here. We're saying, what if not only could you access this, you could learn how to live from there. Think about that as a possibility. So you remember, uh, I'll use Dana from, you know, in the movie, because it's such a great, her testimonial I think is so great, she talked about when she went to write her book, I mean, this is too big, I mean, who was she to write a book? All of those kinds of things. But she, in a sense, tricked her ego by making it a homework project. Very clever. You know, it's really very, very, very clever. So she could use the ego to, uh, let's, what shall I say, um, in service to do something it didn't think it wanted to do in the first place. Clever girl. So what did she do? She took it on as a second year project and the first thing she did was she started writing because that's what the project demanded. She just started writing. So let's take a look at that. Let's say that what she wrote was 40 pages. Well see, what she did by writing the 40 pages was that she increased the amount of positive energy inside of herself with respect to this particular thing of book writing. Understand that? She transformed what used to be negative energy into positive energy. All learning takes place this way. I mean, if we knew it, it wouldn't be learning. There'd be nothing to learn. So now the game starts to get interesting. Now the game starts to get interesting. Because a message at this point is going to go out in Dana's consciousness. And it's going to say something like, well, seems like Dana really wants to move forward and grow. So a message goes out in consciousness that what Dana wants to do is to transform her consciousness 
so that she can align under the writing that she has done. So that the whole consciousness will align under the 40 pages. But now here comes the interesting stuff. In order to do that, all of the mental and all of the emotional and some of the unconscious material that was buried in there and was the reason she didn't want to write the book in the first place is now going to come bubbling up to the surface. One of my favorite quotes is from a gentleman named Jimmy Breslin in the New York Times many years ago. He said, now that you quit drinking, you get to deal with that marvelous personality that started you drinking in the first place. <laughs> it's that idea. It's that idea. There was some reason she said what it was. I wasn't worthy. I was afraid that what I would write wouldn't be worthy. So all this comes bubbling up to the surface. These are what we refer to as unresolved issues. Unresolved issues. And I'll even tell you what they are right now so you don't have to worry about them. I'll define them for you. Again, not that anybody here has any unresolved issues. <laughs> and we'll have a little test in a few minutes to see if you do or not. <laughs> An unresolved issue is anything that disturbs your peace. Think about that. Anything. I don't care how good a reason you have. An unresolved issue is anything that disturbs your peace. We'll have more to say about that. Let's say she's successful, which she was. Otherwise, she couldn't have written the whole book, much less a second one. What then happens is they're healed. They're done. They're released. Done, complete, finished. Never have to go back there again. That's what healing is. It's the completing. It's dissolving of those barriers that Rumi was talking about. All right, so everybody ready? How do you know if you have an unresolved issue? Well, here comes the pop quiz. Do you ever find yourself doing this? Uh-oh. If this is your philosophy of life, where do you think you would seek to intervene? You would try to change the because. It makes perfectly good sense. It's very logical. I would try to change the thing that is at the root of this, that's causing this. Anybody ever succeed at that? I've never met anybody who succeeded at that. If you think about it, this is a total and complete victim position because you've got the power of something running you from outside that you're ascribing to. Something from outside you're blaming on your own upset. On an individual basis, this leads to things like disruptions in relationships, uh, family squabbles and not getting along with family members, uh, business problems, things of that nature. That's on an individual level. On a national level, it's called war. I mean, if you think about what's war, it's one group of people saying, we're upset because of what you're doing over here. And the other group is saying, no, we're upset because of what you're doing, and, and then we go to war over it. It's not a very evolved way to resolve problems. We probably all know that, which is why you're sitting in the room here. The vast majority of people on this planet obviously do not know that yet. In a way, you could think that's an indictment of the entire human race. But in another way, it's not. It's just a statement of where we are as a species in our evolution. You want to stop war? Heal the upsets inside of you. Heal the things that disturb your peace. One of the things that we did was to do a little survey about things that were brought forward by students and graduates, and I'm sure they're not alone in that. What are some of the more common upsets? Not that any of these would be any of yours. <laughs> common upsets. 
Here was the number one. This probably half the people said this one. This was amazing to me. You don't listen to me. There was a woman in the program several years ago stood up in class and shared, my boyfriend told me that I don't listen to him. That was very hard to hear. <laughs> okay. I'm upset because people don't understand me. I'm upset because life is unfair. It's written somewhere, life is supposed to be fair. When it's not, I'm upset and I have good reason. I'm upset because I don't behave as I should, so I'm even upset of myself when I don't behave the way I think I should be behaving. And if all else fails, you can always do <laughs> traffic is terrible. Traffic is terrible. And if that one fails, maybe you're, maybe you're not in the rush hour, you can always go to the government or politics or taxes. It, you know, it, there's always a place that you can go to to justify your upsetness. Well, what's the other possibility? You know, if we don't, if we don't handle upsets, this, what, what other way is there? Is there some other way that we can do this? And the answer is, there is. What if it were possible? What if it were possible there was some way, some process, some technology where you could identify the upset that exists inside of you. You could get in touch with that, and once you were in touch with it, that you could heal it, that you could dissolve it, that you could complete it once and for all. What if you really understood that that's what Rumi is talking about? All you've got to do is discover these things and then heal them. You go up spiritually. I want you to really hear that. Every time you resolve one issue, you grow spiritually. What do you have to do? Well, you have to quit looking for people out there to blame for your disturbance and start focusing on how to heal it inside yourself. Easier said than done. That's why the program takes as long as it takes. As you do that, yes, you will grow spiritually and Oh yes, and this is another little thing that happens, and that is the quality of your life improves significantly. There are two little things. So I want to start bringing this to completion and give you a sense of what we're talking about here visually, if I can. So we said most people in the world are very egocentric, meaning the ego is running the show. Very few people are in touch with, you probably can't even read this from too far away. We made it pretty small on purpose. That's the authentic self in most people. It's there. It's what in spiritual literature is often referred to as the still small voice. It's the, the ego is drowning it out because it's so much in our lives. As we start to do this work and we gain in the awareness of who we are as a divine being having a human experience, this is what begins to happen. <laughs> this is where you're going. Your life stops being ego-driven and starts being authentic self-driven. You know who you are. You know why you're here. And it is so much easier to make a meaningful contribution in your world. So we would end up this evening, at least with this part of it, and then this is the dynamics part, and Mary's going to take you on a little tour. Overall, what would I say the value of a USM education is? We had this conversation with one of our board members, and he said, well, the first thing is, tell them that they'll get a better job. He said, the first thing. Even if that job is the one you already have. Because you'll show up differently in it. Tell them they'll get a better relationship. 
even if that relationship is the one you already have. You'll show up differently in it. You get a master's degree, that's true. A master's degree does have validity. It does count for something out in the world. It is a credential you can put on your, on your resume. And you do come out with a superior skill set. To explain that to you, I always uh, think of the poem If by Rudyard Kipling. He starts out, If you can keep your head while all around you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. So think if you were that person and you're at a business meeting or you're at any, any kind of a get-together with other people and everybody is going crazy, losing their head, but not you. Where are you? You're in your peace. You're in your loving. Do you think you're going to be a more effective team player in that organization or less? You show up differently in every area of your life. So it's all about how you show up. USM gives you an edge. Now don't hang us for this. That's why we call it education. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.